don't have to tell you how great the grandkids are. Uh, you know that. But I'm here to tell you as their principal that every day with your grandchildren is just a great blessing. Uh, they are what makes St. Croix St. Croix. Our staff is great. Uh, the, the education is great. But the students here and their abilities and their gifts and their commitment to uh, learning Christian values and truths here at St. Croix uh, is amazing. And I'm pretty blessed. I consider myself pretty lucky to get to spend every day with your grandchildren. So even more than your parents do, maybe sometimes. So uh, just happy to have them and you guys here. So in just a little bit, we are going to have many more students come and join us, believe it or not. Uh, fortunately, we left some seating up in front uh, for them. After chapel, I just want to go over some things that we're going to do after chapel. We, we are going to say goodbye to your grandchildren as much as we love them. They're going to go to fourth set, okay? And then they'll rejoin you after the fourth set for lunch. Uh, after chapel, grandparents and uh, a few select students, jazz bands, and some students who are going to interview, they'll go to the auditorium and they will entertain you. Um, unlike any entertainment that you've ever seen before, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, so we will go to the auditorium, and then after that will be lunch. If I could just ask a quick favor of you, and experience is the best way to learn things. Last year during chapel, we had about seven phones go off. So if you could silence your phones by about 10:30, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and you know, we do a really good job of having the students not bring their phones to chapel, and I don't want to have to chastise any grandparents this year for, for that. Okay, so in about 10 minutes or so, we'll have some of the other students join us, and then chapel will get rolling, and then I'll come back up and dismiss in a certain way so we can get to the auditorium quickly and efficiently. Thanks again. You can chat amongst yourselves for about 10 minutes.
Good morning. Welcome to Grandparents Day. It is great to see you all here today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Ryan Rachi, and I serve St. Croix as the academic dean. And it is my privilege to start our worship together today. So we begin our chapel service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then we will begin with our opening song.
This week we've been discussing and revisiting the different places of the Passion as we lead up to Holy Week. Uh, but before we get to the place that we're going to discuss today, we're going to dis discuss a topic that is near and dear to many of us, including grandparents. And that is the topic of sleep. <laughs> we're going to start with a little discussion. So if you're sitting next to your grandparents, you can talk to your grandparents. And if your grandparents aren't here, you can talk to a student next to you. And we'll use the hand up method. When my hand goes up, your hand goes up, and we stop talking. So what you're going to discuss in the next 30 seconds or so is share one thing that helps you fall asleep. Go. According to the experts, here are some recommended strategies to help you fall asleep. See how many of these might be difficult or easy for you to incorporate. Lower the room temperature to a range around 60 to 67 degrees. Have a consistent sleep and wake schedule. Teenagers struggle with this one. Avoid naps. Listen to relaxing music. That one might be kind of easy. Exercise during the day. This one's really hard. Turn off all electronics and limit caffeine. That'd be kind of hard. This last one is almost impossible for most of you, and that is to be a male Rachi. I don't have any research behind this last one, but I've got some observational data, and it's pretty rock solid. This is my only living grandparent, my 92-year-old grandpa, Marlon Rachi. He lives in a farm in Michigan, and he's lived on that farm his entire life. In fact, he was born in the kitchen of the house that he still lives in. I have lots of great and fond memories of my grandpa, but one of the enduring ones is this. Um, after a big family meal, he falls asleep in his chair. He has passed that great talent down to my father, <laughs> James Rachi, seen here after a family meal, who has also passed that down to his son, me, <laughs> Ryan Rachi, seen here at age three, after a meal. I have never had any problems falling asleep. Uh, when I put my head on the pillow, I'm literally asleep in like 10 to 15 seconds. It is a great gift to have. However, there are some downsides. When I was in high school and in college, my dormitory roommates, they could be talking to me, but if I was in bed, I probably heard the first half of the sentence that they were talking about. When I first got married to my wife, we would pray in bed together. I, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word together because as soon as she started talking, I was out. <laughs> Young gentlemen, if you ever have the privilege of being married someday, I highly recommend you do not fall asleep while your wife is talking. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm still married. Um, large part due to the magnificent understanding of my wife. But anyway, uh, this week in chapel, we are visiting the, revisiting the places of the Passion as we lead up to Easter, and today's is the Garden of Gethsemane. Yesterday, we were in the upper room where the disciples celebrated the biggest holiday of the year for the Jewish people, the Feast of the Passover. If you're sharp, you might have caught that little bit of foreshadowing. Right after the feast of the Passover, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is where we pick it up today. From Mark chapter 14, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to the disciples, sit here while I pray. 
He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Yikes. Uh, I can certainly relate to the disciples here. While I don't condone their sleeping on Jesus, I can sympathize a bit. They had just had a very big holiday meal. And it was a really busy day and a really busy week for them. But when your friend is distressed and troubled and straight out tells you that their soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, you might want to listen. But nope, they fall asleep. Then Jesus wakes them up and scolds them and tells them to pray, and they fall asleep again. He finds them sleeping a third time, and he wakes them up. Despite their best intentions, they can't stay awake. And the disciples are so embarrassed, they don't even know how to respond. Our encouragement for today is to don't sleep on Jesus. And there are two things I'd like to share about this. There's the obvious literal and physical mental application of not sleeping on Jesus. We don't want to physically sleep on Jesus in church or in chapel or in religion class, even if you're tired or just had a meal. Falling asleep mentally and being distracted is an issue of focus and engagement. If you're really engaged, in some activity, you're not going to fall asleep or have your mind wander to something else. But as Jesus said, our spirits may be willing, but our flesh is weak. And we can't always follow through as we would like because of our sinful natures. The slang term of the use of not to sleep on someone is to be ready and not underestimate them. I often heard this term from my sports coaches when we were scouting an opponent. And they were warning us not to underestimate a certain player or overlook a certain team. I think the disciples in the Bible underestimated Jesus as well, and so do we. How do we do that? Well, number one, Jesus is the almighty Son of God, King of the universe. He created everything in it, including us. He has provided for all our needs, our physical needs here on earth, but especially our need for a Savior. We're not perfect. We do things we shouldn't do all the time. We're selfish. We cheat. We lie. We gossip. We're lazy. We complain. We worry. We're also guilty of not doing things we know we should, whether it's homework or chores or being kind and loving to others. We fall short on those things, and because of that, we need a Savior. And God took care of that for us in Jesus. But we sleep on Jesus when we fail and we underestimate him and fail to trust in him in all things. He can handle everything. He tells us not to worry or be anxious about anything. He's got it. He tells us to go to him in times of trouble. He's got that. To pray to him continually because he can handle it. Ultimately, we can be at peace and not the temporary or limiting peace that we find in this world but the true, eternal, and everlasting peace that comes from the salvation that Jesus won for us on the cross. So as we visit the places of the Passion leading up to Easter, let's not sleep on Jesus. Yes, let's not physically sleep in church or in chapel or mentally drift off. But more importantly, let's not underestimate the power of God to provide for our physical and our spiritual needs and to live in the peace that can only come from him. Amen. We're going to continue with the band.
Faith by Matt Conaway is a stirring anthem that celebrates the resilience and strength found in unwavering belief. Based on the doxology, Faith was written following the passing of Justice Hollifield, a 13-year-old trumpet player in Harshman Middle School. Through its emotive lyrics and uplifting melody, the song encapsulates the journey of overcoming adversity and finding solace in the power of faith. It is hard to miss a song starting off dismal and sorrowful, with a lone trumpet feature reminding the audience of the loss of justice. However, the song does not stop there. The piece moves forward to an almost overwhelming amount of joyful emotion, just as the faith we all have can flood us with joy, despite the sorrows. The pain of the loss has not vanished, but the perspective has shifted as the stirring mixture of passionate phrases encapsulates how justice's life can be celebrated and remembered. The song then culminates in a mirrored way like it started, featuring the lone trumpet doxology. However, instead of despair, this time the trumpet leaves us with a phrase encompassed by peace, a peace that is only found by faith. Matt Conaway's face serves as a, a reminder of the importance of perseverance and trust in times of uncertainty. I encourage you to listen to the message used in this song a song that displays a powerful meaning. Even within all of Earth's tragedies, do not be conquered by the hardships. Instead, shift your focus to the blessings of our Heavenly Father has given each and every one of us. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.
Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, as we retrace the last stages of your time here on earth and evaluate our lives and our relationship with you, we realize that we often sleep on you and we underestimate you and your power. You hold all authority in heaven and on earth, but yet we don't trust you as we should and we worry about a great many things. Like the disciples, our spirit may be willing, but our flesh is weak. Please forgive us for our weakness and help us to fear, love, and trust in you above all things. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go and live in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. We'll conclude with singing the doxology. All right, first of all, join me in thanking 